Hello, my name is Amanda Palmer. Um, I'm a sociologist, um, although I did also read human sciences myself uh, way back. Um, I now tutor in sociology on the human sciences degree course, and I am involved um, over many, many years um, in the admissions interview process. Hello, I'm Thomas Cousins. I'm also a tutor in human sciences. I'm a social anthropologist by training and I provide tutorials and lectures across the degree program in anthropology. So what we have now is um, an opportunity for us to just share with you um, what happens in an Oxford interview for human sciences. Uh, so uh, the typical thing to expect um, is that uh, your interview would be conducted by two people, uh, two people very involved with human sciences and the teaching of it. Um, they will be people um, who may be in different disciplines and working from different colleges. Uh, but nevertheless, there will be that common core of people with a knowledge of human sciences and what we're looking for in candidates. Um, in the Oxford system, um, if you are shortlisted for interview, you will get um, at least two college interviews. This is designed to maximise your chances of gaining a place to come and read human sciences with us. So that would be the typical pattern. Uh, that if you are at, if you are selected as a candidate uh, for interview, um, there will be um, a main college, which would be um, your temporary residence for the period of two or three days. Um, if it's in, if it's a case that we are interviewing using Teams, uh, then that wouldn't apply, of course. Um, but one way or the other, um, there will be one main college, uh, which is your base. Um, and then there will be a secondary college that will also interview you. And they will each do that independently. Um, there will be no conferring uh, between the colleges. Um, they will each interview you and it will stand alone as an interview. It will be later uh, when that information is pooled, uh, when we're busy selecting candidates. Um, so that I think is the broad framework. Interviews typically take um, between 20 minutes and half an hour. Um, and then maybe to look at the detail of, you know, what are we looking for in you when we interview you, um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Thomas to say a few words. Thanks, Amanda. So in the Oxford interview in human sciences, we don't assume that you'll have any prior knowledge of any of the disciplines that we teach. Uh, and so what we're looking for is not a particular content, but what we're looking for is how you think and how you respond to uh, new information in the moment. So the structure of the interview is quite similar to a tutorial of the kind that you would have at Oxford in the human sciences degree. Uh, tutorials typically last about an hour, but the interview will be a bit shorter, obviously. And you can expect a fair amount of conversation back and forth and learning together. So what we're looking for in a candidate is somebody who will benefit from that tutorial experience, being able to think um, in dialogue, think on your feet, uh, absorb new information, um, and to be curious. So uh, in a sense, what you can prepare for is being presented with something that uh, you haven't encountered before potentially, and we're looking for um, how you think creatively and rigorously and carefully um, uh, and, and impress us in, in, in that way. Yes, I, I agree, agree entirely, Thomas. I, I can't think of anything to add other than to stress. We really, really would love you to try to be yourself. Um, you will be nervous inevitably, but try to quell those nerves and look upon it as a sit down conversation between three people you and two tutors, all interested in human sciences, um, and to try to relax into that conversation um, and, and not be concerned about silences. Um, you know, if we ask you something, don't feel, oh, I've got to fill, you know, the silence straight away. You don't, you know, there's thinking time uh, for you to put your thoughts together. And we love to hear your thinking. And it's fine to say, um, well, I don't know, it might be so and such. 
um, and then to be literally speaking aloud uh, why you think it might be that or actually why no you don't think it's likely to be that it's likely to be something else that's exactly what we want to hear those thought processes at work so the degree program is very interdisciplinary and um, if you study human sciences at oxford you'd be learning the full range of disciplines from uh, anthropology and sociology through genetics, demography, um, evolutionary primatology, for example. Um, and so in its very broadest scope, we're interested in uh, candidates who, who are interested in the human condition, very broadly speaking, and, and who enjoys that interdisciplinary way of thinking. So we very much look forward to your application and to seeing you at Oxford. Hi there, hi. Um, that's uh, Malayo, I believe, yes? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to see you for this interview for Human Sciences. Um, let me introduce who we are, first of all. Um, my name is Dr. Amanda Palmer. Um, I'm a sociologist um, teaching my subject within the Human Sciences degree course. Um, as it happened, I read human sciences myself as well. Uh, so I have that longer uh, connection to the degree course as well. Um, and there is my uh, colleague here, uh, Dr. Thomas Cousins. Uh, he is an anthropologist and he also has uh, long-standing connections uh, teaching on the human sciences degree course. Um, we anticipate the interview will be about 20 minutes. Um, we'll both be asking you some questions um, uh, one at a time um, and there'll be time at the end for you to just ask us anything, if there's anything on your mind. Um, please relax. We very much want you to be able to feel relaxed enough to just talk to us um, and we're very, very interested in the way you think. That's the important thing. Uh, first of all then, um, why, why human sciences? Why have you applied for that course? So I think for me, it's been a bit of a journey because I actually originally thought I was going to be a medical doctor coming from a, coming from a Nigerian background where I like to say the, the Holy Trinity is medicine, law and engineering. That was the route I started to go down. But I saw the human sciences degree and I think it was really just a big combination of what I really wanted to do in terms of exploring the biological aspects of humanity, but then also really getting to challenging question the more social side of things, the more psychological side of things, which I think isn't, isn't really as applicable to someone who becomes a medical doctor in the same way as a human scientist. Okay, well, it sounds like you've given that some thought. Um, and thank you for that. And we may well pick up on some of the things and threads that you've mentioned in there in a moment. But first of all, I really want to hand you over to my, my colleague, Dr. Cousins. Thank you. Great, thanks. Hi, Malaya. Thanks for joining us. And um, as you know, the Human Sciences degree program is uh, very interdisciplinary. You learn many different subjects and, and you learn a way of thinking between these different disciplines. So uh, I'm a social anthropologist and I'm interested in a range of questions about what it means to be human uh, as a social being um, and, and the various ways in which uh, human life comes into uh, a kind of social relational perspective. I'm, I'm going to show you an image uh, which I'd like to uh, ask you some questions about and um, you may uh, you, you may have seen this before, you may not have, that's all right. Um, firstly, can you confirm for me that you can see this image? Yes, I can see the image. Right, so uh, you may have seen the film when it came out, this film Free Solo. Uh, if you haven't, that's totally fine. It's, that's, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But um, in case you haven't seen it, this is a film about uh, a young man who has climbed uh, El Capitan in the US. It's an incredibly tall rock face without the use of any ropes. So it's, uh, it's a remarkable human feat. Um, but I'm interested as a, as a social anthropologist, but more as a human scientist, why, why do you think human sciences might be interested in this feat. Yeah, okay, great. So I think, first of all, one of the biggest reasons human sciences would be interested in this is just the sheer biological ability to do so. 
in terms of, for example, the, the altitude, how the hairs of the body would have adjusted to that, when, particularly when it got higher, in terms of the ability to hang on and climb and how that's relating to muscle mass and muscle twitching. And yeah, and so then I think building on that from the social side, it's what kind of pressures have driven him to climb El Capitan? What, what has uh, led to him getting to this point? And psychologically, how is he faring as he starts to climb up this rock, this rock face and uh, the challenges that entail? I think for me particularly, I'd probably be, be, uh, be scared to death. I mean, you kind of are, you kind of have to be at that point. And so I think those would be two of the main considerations for the human sciences. Yeah, thank you. That's that's great. And uh, you mentioned uh, being scared to death, and I'm, I'm sure I would be too. But so, uh, how should we understand this uh, particular individual, his ability to do something um, that most of us would have been paralysed with fear about? Um, how do you think we might understand that aspect of it? Uh, I think particularly it would show, well. One, it might show an element of practice that he had done some climbing to a degree, which clearly built up a bit of resilience in him. And then second of all, I think it would maybe show a mental fortitude, which might be beyond the average. Uh -huh. Right. OK, so that mental question is interesting. Um, you mentioned a moment ago a sense of pressure or drive. Um, do, do you have any uh, I, uh, thoughts about about why human beings might feel uh, that kind of pressure or, or being driven to do these things? How might that uh, have come about? I think uh, oftentimes it can be social pressures. So when, so for example, if I promise to a group of friends that I'm going to make them a meal, I think then there might be that pressure then that comes upon me to actually fulfill that promise, to fulfill that action and make that meal or if people or on the flip side, if people said, oh, you could never do this. So if people said to him, you could never climb it, he might be then almost pressured, but not in a bad way, but in like a jokey way to almost do it as like a, a feat of strength, a feat of showing, actually, I can do this. Great. Well, so so in a, in a way, what you've mentioned there is, is one aspect of it is very social, which is the sense of obligation to others, which is a very social phenomenon. Um, and you've also mentioned... Um, this idea of a dare or being able to perform in a way that impresses others. That's, and that is um, uh, deeply social, but we can think about that social in, in, in several different ways. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, relationships in the current moment, as you've suggested. Um, but we can also think about those kinds of social relationships in more evolutionary terms, in terms of um, how it is that humans uh, have evolved to work together. And yet here we have an individual who's doing something completely on his own. Um, how, how do you think we might think about um, this completely singular, unusual feat? Uh, it doesn't seem very social on the face of it. Um, how do you think uh, in human sciences we might understand that singular, unique um, aspect of it? So from specifically from an evolutionary perspective, well, any any perspective, really. That that is it. I think that is an interesting question. Um, I think he. I think in terms of why he's done it alone, there must be there must be a, a personal drive in there. So I think separate to how we've discussed kind of social pressures, there typically is an inner drive that individuals have, which I guess would be the reasoning behind why certain times when people face all sorts of adversity from everyone else around them, they'd still be willing to persist in activity. And I think we, that could be seen here as well. That's right. So, so he, he could be doing it for, for intensely internal reasons to do with his own makeup, his own sense of self-worth, let's say. We, could, we, we would have to watch the film and, and hear what he has to say about that. Yeah. Um, I suppose one way we might compare this with other species is to ask, well, do, do other animals do this uh, that we know of? And why might they do that? And I suppose if, if there are other species and other individuals who, who do this kind of uh, um, very unusual thing, um, 
what 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 explains that commonality, or if it's very unusual, um, how should we think about this in evolutionary terms for human beings? We've never seen an individual do this before. Um, should should we therefore redefine our concept of what it means to be human as a species that climbs rock faces? Um, I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say we should redefine humanity because this is one exception in a group of in a group in a, I guess a whole species in the same way you might find some some members of a species which for example might use tools but that doesn't therefore mean that the species as a whole is a tool using species and in then in the same way I would suggest that because he is climbing rock face a rock face that wouldn't mean that humans do I think if you found um, other species which did it I think it would pose a challenge in terms of evolutionary lineage. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there aren't many other species that would probably attempt such a thing. But I think this maybe shows a element of ignorance towards the, the risk of death. I guess if we're putting life and continuing to survive at the apex of evolution, then perhaps this is humans almost ignoring that inner aspect of themselves. Yeah, thank you. That's that's very interesting. Uh, you brought up a whole range of really interesting ideas there, uh, in, including our relationship to death and what that means for us at the level of meaning. Um, but so one final question that I that I'd be interested to hear you think about. You know, here's a film that's been made about it. Many people have watched it. I, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but why do you think other people want to watch this film? And what does it mean, do you think, that we've made a film about this, and especially one that's done so well? I think we it means that we recognise how much of an amazing feat it is. It's clearly not something that's easy to do. And then I think another reason why we've made a film out of it is because it's uh, it almost gives people a second-hand thrill. It's like you look at the challenge, you survey the scene, and then people are like, wow, how has he done this? And they want to find out more. And then I think also... From that perspective, it it makes it profitable. And so there's also the human aspect of people wanting to make money from a film, and then you can add that element into it. And then also the aspect of, particularly, I think I can see a film festival logo on there. If you know, film festivals are very much, like can be very artsy, very much about creating a really good craft as opposed to making big bucks like a lot of the films that you see in a cinema. Um, speaking of someone who actually used to work in a cinema, and so maybe there's that element of creating a film which is more dramatic, more personable, as opposed to, um, you know, superheroes like you see in all the Marvel films. Well, that's interesting. OK, so so you're saying it it uh, allows us to reconnect with human experience, something that's quite near to human experience. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So you've mentioned several interesting things in there, and, and one of them has to do with the possibility for vicarious experience. You're, you're seeing somebody else do something uh, which provokes a, a response for you as, as, a, as another kind of uh, animal, as it were. So that's an interesting um, biological phenomenon in itself. Uh, you mentioned uh, ideas about profit, which, which raise uh, big social questions about how markets work and what kinds of commodities uh, sell. Uh, but you've also brought out the idea that there's something that's being crafted here, something that's um, an art, um, as opposed to merely, say, for example, a biological uh, reaction. And so we like to struggle with these kinds of questions about uh, what makes us human in, in terms of our capacities for, for not only for tool use, as you mentioned, but also our capacity for art and representation. So so you've, re you've brought up a whole range of interesting ideas there, which, uh, which are wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to my colleague. OK, um, let's turn to something quite different now then, Maleo. And just to let you know, um, you may have heard me scribbling in the background. We do take notes because it helps us to know uh, what you've said when afterwards we're thinking about your interview. Um, you said um, um, in your UCAS application, um, in your personal statement, you mentioned that you'd been doing some a project um, at school about um, uh, well, genetic engineering, gene editing, in fact. Yeah. Um, and you just said you were aware that there would be ethical or there could be ethical issues. 
I'm just wondering what's on your mind? What do you see as the ethical issues in gene editing? Uh, I think a lot of the issues, are, uh, they go around particularly the worries about designer babies. And I think that's something which the media grabs onto very well as well, because I think it's something that's a bit more believable as an image for people to, to recognize. And so in that the idea that, okay, people are gonna start selecting for um, particular traits in their children. So not just physical traits, but then also trying to select for, you know, genes that might make someone more successful in school, for example. And then how, then how does that affect the world economy? Does it just become about who can afford, you know, to do the most gene editing on their children as opposed to really, I guess, much, much of what happens after someone's born? So does it matter if individual people have opportunities to sort of tinker with the genetic code of the offspring that they're going to have? I mean, I would say from, from an atheistic framework, I don't see why it matters. Or, or not necessarily atheistic, but non-theistic framework, I wouldn't see why it would matter so much. But I think a lot of the issues stem around whether people recognise it or not is that there is a bit of a theistic framework underpinning principles, particularly in Western society. And I think those principles then affect how people view things such as designer babies. Would it matter in a genetic sense at all? Hmm. Can I ask what do you mean by that? Um, well, you're looking at it from the point of view of individuals um, yeah. and whether it would matter in relation to maybe values and moral codes. Um, does it matter biologically? Yes. If we gene editing? I believe, I believe so, because if you're looking at the gene pool as a whole, gene editing, say everyone decides to select for a certain trait, that would reduce your variability and could in fact then increase your population susceptibility to a to a disease if it so comes along which affects that gene for example so what would your what would your view be then in relation to um the ethics of editing would you would you support any um policies to put criteria in place or or not yeah so i think this is interesting because i would have i would have probably said i support editing when it's re used to remove a like a life-threatening condition something like or something which severely reduces one's quality of life so perhaps like a cystic fibrosis with the cftr gene but i've also read people who have said that to remove that from their lives would be like taking away a part of them and i think that's a very interesting nuance which means to be honest entirely i'm not so sure but i would probably that is where i'd lean OK, well, thank you for that. Let me uh, turn to something completely different, um, life expectancy. Um, here in the West, um, there's a pretty sort of solid pattern that women typically live a good five to eight years longer than men. Yeah. Why do you think that might be? Uh, I think one thing is that men put themselves in more riskier situations. I don't okay, know that, yeah, that's, that's I think a possibility. The, the typical idea is that that's fueled by adrenaline. I'm not sure how true that is, maybe partly true, but a men are, so even if you look at driving, for example, that men are more likely to drive, um, drive uh, recklessly so, to the point where, you know, if you're a man, you're going to get charged more by your insurance, at least I think initially, than you would if you're a woman, because they know that men tend to get into accidents more than women do. OK, so that's one possible reason. Can you think of any others? Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure if there's a genetic underpinning behind it, but I do suspect there would be some kind of, some kind of influence there. OK, anything else though in terms of lifestyle? You've mentioned that men maybe take more risks. Um, and yes, that's oh. a perfectly valid thing to suggest. Um, anything else, though, about uh, different lifestyles that might affect it? I think I think women are also known to eat healthier to, on average than men. That's another thing which would influence, your, I think, particularly if we're looking towards the latter end, so that kind of five to eight years, say, or like a 70-year life expectancy. I think 
those habits of how you eat, and particularly in the previous 34 years, do have a big influence. And um, particularly if men are eating more um, kind of fatty foods, are taking in more lipids, and you know building up that that uh, that L those LDLs in their system, I think that that might be an influence as well. Okay. Um and would you expect um, the same sort of um, age gap to be present um, across all social classes? Or do you think it might differ as you go between different occupational uh, hierarchies? I think it would uh, I think it would differ between different social classes, because I think when you get to when you're earning more. I reckon. I reckon the difference would be lesser, and when you're earning less, the difference would be greater because uh, those uh, those natural differences, I think, in behaviour, which we tend to see, I think, would be amplified with a with a low lower finances, and like minimised with higher finances, particularly because, for example, with food, it's a lot easier to outsource the kind of responsibility for that when you have more finances, and a lot easier to buy higher quality food when you have more money, as opposed to if you're struggling for finances, you're more likely in oftentimes to turn towards a low quality diet. And uh, a final question for me, I think, because so of the time factor, um, would you expect that same uh, gap in men's and women's life expectancy, expectancy uh, to be there across the whole world? Would you imagine it's a universal phenomenon? Uh, I think it would partly be universal, so I, I would expect that there'd be a gap similarly across the world, but not necessarily to the same degree. I think there would be shifts in terms of how different cultures see the role of men and women, or not necessarily the role of men and women, but how being a man or a woman is acted out in different cultures. And I think that would therefore influence things like health. Okay. I'm only hesitating because I'm writing down what you said. OK, thank you very much for those thoughts. I'm looking at the time and I think maybe we are pretty much out of time. Um, but before we draw it to a close, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask of us, Malaya? Yeah, so I, I think at the start you mentioned that you did human sciences. So how would you say the course has changed on a broad scale between when you did it and now? Um, the short answer is not a lot. Um, the, content, the content has changed massively as we have great gained in knowledge, especially in the fields of genetics um, and things to do with evolution and, and animal behaviour. While all the disciplines have grown, to be honest, you know, our, our knowledge um, in anthropology is, is uh, much more refined um, than it was when I did it. Um, the structure of the course, um, the interdisciplinary nature of it, um, is still absolutely there and, and present. Um, and we're trying to make those connections for you all the time uh, during the three years of the degree program. Um, it's a lovely degree. Anyway, um, anything else you need to ask us, please? No, I think that's it. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we'll have to say goodbye at this point. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Malaya. Excellent. Thanks very much, Moraya, for that interview. And um, now what we're going to do is reflect uh, a little bit on that conversation. In the actual admissions interview, uh, the candidates uh, don't get to discuss afterwards with the interviewers. Um, but in this instance, uh, it'll be very nice to have your reflections included as well. So uh, first what we'll do is uh, Amanda and I will just uh, reflect on, on the interview, what we thought uh, was, was good and what we thought uh, could be strengthened. Um, and then we'll turn to you, Malaya, and ask for some of your thoughts uh, for the benefit of anyone who's going to, to watch this video. Um, so let me start off by saying that, you know, when we were talking about um, the three solo movie, um, what I was really impressed by was uh, Malaya's ability to think across a number of different uh, possible perspectives very quickly. Um, what, what I was appreciating was uh, thinking about the biological aspects, um, thinking about physiology, thinking about the social, thinking about psychology, 
uh, you know, the conversation was really wide ranging. Um, and uh, there was also a moment when Malayo paused uh, to gather his thoughts. And I thought that was very useful. Uh, gave him an extra beat or two to, to think, to stop, uh, think carefully, and then to proceed. Um, so I quite, I really enjoyed that. Um, Amanda, what did you think about that part of it? Uh, yes, I agree with you. I saw uh, immediately that he um, looked at the physical side of being able to even uh, complete this feat, um, but then also looked at the psychological aspects. Those were the two he picked out first. And then he differentiated between the psychology of the person who actually even attempts it, followed by the psychology of what's going on while he's attempting it. And, you know, that differentiation there I thought was really interesting. Um, he mentioned uh, mental fortitude or drive of the person. Um, and like you, I noticed when he said, oh, that's an interesting question. And he stopped a moment. And I was really pleased uh, because he didn't feel he just had to fill the space. So I, I liked that. And then uh, you know, what he said afterwards uh, was very, very sensible. Um, um, and then we got on to, you know, whether there's maybe um, something evolutionary in this. Um, is there, a, uh, and um, I would say it was a question he'd maybe not thought about before. That's how it came across to me. Um, and so he really was having to sort of dig deep and think about it um, in relation to, well, do other animals do this? And does it make sense? Um, if we're evolved to be social creatures, why go and do something so solitary? Um, uh, I, I, I suppose, I don't know, but we'll hear from Maleo. Um, it, it sounded like you were struggling a little bit there to piece together what you wanted to say. Um, uh, but what I did hear in it um, was um, when you said about, I'm looking at my notes, that's why I'm looking across here. Um, when you talked about uh, maybe people diff differently experience the risk of death. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And I was well aware that almost certainly the, the conversation could have gone on longer, but we, we blocked it because we knew we had a chunk of time each with you. Um, uh, but I could see that there was a, a continuing conversation that could have uh, been developed there um, because you were saying interesting things about it. Any, anything else from you? Um, uh, at all, Thomas. No, I, I agree with you. I, I um, well, I really like that part of the conversation. Well, one thing that I didn't ask about, and which Malaya didn't mention, was the question which we should ask ourselves about whether this is a human universal or whether it might appear differently in different societies. And that's an interesting comparative question, which um, you know, I guess from the point of view of human sciences, we're always struggling with. Uh, the question of what's particular or local and what's universal in general. And, and, and so that's an, that would be an interesting way to think about this, this part of the question. So, but in general, I, I thought Malawi did very well on this. So yeah, let's move to the other parts. Amanda, what did you think? Um, uh, right, should we do that before we see what Malawi thinks about this part? Yeah. So um, I referred to gene editing because his UCAS statement had said he'd been involved um, in a, pro a project and he'd presented some material at school. Um, and um, I was just interested um, to hear his thoughts about um, any um, ethical considerations in gene editing. I mentioned it because he mentioned it in his form. So I think that's important. I didn't just pick it out of the ether. Um, he expressed an interest in the ethics of gene editing. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, I uh, he gave me answers in relation to, well, you know, the media is uh, bigging it up in terms of design of babies. Um, so I'm probing and saying, does it matter? Um, and um, uh, I think you answered um, partially in relation to, say, moral concerns um, or beliefs and so on. Um, so I deliberately then said, and are there any biological implications or words to that effect? Um, and, and then moved on to, well, uh, and you mentioned at that point, um, Malayo, you mentioned, um, well, yes, it, it could be detrimental for the gene pool. Um, again, I could have expanded. We could have little bit more um, uh, but I was aware of time 
and you know we were on a 20 25 minute schedule and i wanted to get another question um, in uh, on a completely different topic um uh, what i did do though was i finished off on policy um should that should we have policies to control it um and i very much liked your answer in relation to cystic fibrosis which comes up quite often as well this this is a very sort of you know damaging disorder maybe that is something that we should maybe uh, try to gene edit so that the individual is born and doesn't have the cystic fibrosis um, um but I really like the fact that you said, uh, but actually people with cystic fibrosis have spoken out um, and they've said, well, look, um, it is part of me. Um, it is, a, to me, a valuable part of me. Um, it was an interesting, I think, uh, thing that you should say, um, because you're stepping back and th saying, well, scientists shouldn't necessarily speak for people. Or, or, or th think that they know what is right for people. Um, so I, I thought that was really um, a good um, answer that you thought about. Um, on to life expectancy. Um, yes, I mean, there are dozens and dozens of think reasons uh, why life expectancy is different between men and women. Um, uh, you mentioned men might put themselves more at risk. There are many other social factors as well. Um, you thought maybe there were genetic ones. I didn't probe that uh, particularly, um, but um, you you moved on to, uh, when I sort of asked you for more information, you thought maybe um, women had healthier eating habits, for example. Um, you thought when I, again, go deeper into social class, you said, um, uh, you thought there would be a difference. Uh, there would be a social class gradient. Um, uh, because they will, it will uh, basically income will affect behaviours and the example you chose was food. Um, so nutrition and money is the one that you thought of. Um, and then again, we could have had a lovely long conversation about that, but there wasn't time. Um, and so I finished off with, well, do you think this would be a, a kind of a worldwide universal phenomenon um, that women live longer than men? Um, and um, you thought very much on the cultural side that it's going to depend very much on uh, not so much the biology of the person, but the culture of the person um, affecting um, their life and their, their, their chances and their choices. Uh, those are my words, not yours, but um, that's what you were saying. Uh, so um, I probed on two different topics and I thought you followed me well. You, you you picked up uh, exactly what the question was about. Um, you were able to answer me um, in a relaxed and calm way. Um, and I'm sure, but we're going to find out now, I expect, um, if this was a real interview, you would go, you would leave the room and say, oh, I didn't think of so and such. And I could have said this and I could have said that. And that is inevitable. I mean, that's always going to happen. You know, that you've, if you've only got a few minutes, later on, you're going to think, well, if I had half an hour, I could have said so much more. Um, and so uh, that's always perfectly OK. Uh, I, I think we got answers which were perfectly acceptable um, in the time we gave you. But we need to hear it all from your point of view. Shall we go back to the top again? Yeah, um, sure. So I think basically with the part which Thomas led, I found I think I found the beginning quite interesting and I think I was able to engage very well with that. But then, as you mentioned, when you brought in the point of evolution, I think that was a point where I was like, alarm bells when we started to ring. I was like, how do I approach this from that perspective? And I found it a really challenging question in a good way. But I think then I had to, had to take a bit of a pause to really start to think about, start to think about it from different perspectives. I think in my head, I was very much thinking of lineage and thinking about like evolutionary trees. And I think I got a bit too stuck in thinking about it from that perspective. That I wasn't then able to maybe tie in some of the broader themes of evolution that we discussed. Um, and then in the second section, I think I was also, I think I was a bit sad. I didn't actually, when I made the differentiation between theistic and non-theistic, I think that was probably too simplified and maybe adding in a humanistic view, which, um, I'd actually read in a book called Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. That's a little recommendation. 
Um, and that was actually, I think they discussed gene editing in the light of like humanism as well. And so it was actually a bit disappointing in hindsight to think, oh, I could have mentioned that as well. But I, I did enjoy that too. And um, yeah, I, I think overall, I think all the all the interview questions were quite challenging and stimulating and I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Mario. I wanted to ask you to what extent you thought um, you might have been answering the questions uh, having had the benefit of a year or two of human sciences already. And to what extent you think you could answer those questions differently in the same way uh, as a candidate when you were originally applying. Yeah, so I think at the end when I talked about cultures and how men and women are different between cultures, I think that was something which was definitely informed by my studies, particularly in anthropology, how we talk about gender as performative. Um, and so that was something that was in my head when I thought about that. But I think particularly um, with what with most of what we discussed, Amanda, I think particularly because you use my personal statement, it was very much things which I'd read maybe three, four years ago, which were still in my mind now. So I think that was less human science-y. But when I think when we were talking about the free solo, the poster, I think that raised a few issues around sociology and anthropology and then particularly I was thinking about altitude that's something that came comes up in the first year in the physiology part of the course which is something that came to mind as well. So you think maybe that may not have come to you um, if if you'd been asked that the first yeah. time round. Right? Mm, okay no that's interesting. Um, but did you feel any of the questions were unfair or unfriendly or pushy? No, I think uh, they were they were completely fair and probing, but in a good way, because I think when you probed, it enabled me to actually be clearer in what I thought, as opposed to kind of skimming the surface of the ideas. Mm. OK. Well, um, I mean, from our point of view, uh, yes, I mean, I think that did absolutely follow uh, exactly the kind of line of questioning that might come up. Um, and what we got from you as a candidate was very much um, considered answers, um, thoughtful answers. Um, and, you know, you, you picked up the board and you ran with it. So thank you very much. It's, it's also worth mentioning that you know, every year the questions will be different. Uh, different colleagues at different colleges will ask very different questions. And these are questions that are not designed to trip you up. They just questions that are designed to show how you think. And if you've been shortlisted for an interview at Oxford, it means that you're very capable. Everybody's smart and brilliant. And we're, we're looking for qualities in a student who will thrive at a place like Oxford in this tutorial modality. So I thought uh, that our conversation today was very um, demonstrative of that. And um, Malaya, I thought you did very well. And um, we look very much forward to um, more applications from fantastic candidates.